All right, guys, uh, welcome all. Welcome to another uh, webinar of the Sit by Webinar series. Today, we have a very special and esteemed guest, Professor Leo Paz from the University of Auckland. Um, I'm very pleased to, to have you all here in this uh, webinar room. Uh, I myself, I'm the moderator today. My name is Dr. Emil Eidenberg, and I'm a senior lecturer at James Cook University, Singapore, and also the Singapore director of SIDBA. Uh, Professor Leo Paz and myself, we know each other a longer time. I've been very long time ago, I've been a student of him, and later on, he was one of my co-supervisors of my PhD. Professor Leo Paz um, started his career um, in one of the greatest, the biggest uh, commercial banks uh, from the Netherlands, the ING Group. It was the post bank in that time. And later on, started his academic career as an assistant professor in Tilburg University, moved on as associate professor uh, from 2006 to 2014 at the VU University Amsterdam, and then moved to New Zealand at Massey University, where he was a professor in marketing at the School of Communication, Journalism, and Marketing in uh, New Zealand. In 2019, Professor Leo Paz um, started as a professor in market, marketing at the University of Auckland, and later on he became the academic head, the head of department of uh, marketing in the University of Auckland. His expertise is, is marketing and uh, revolving around big data, big data, uh, big data analytics, as well as also some other research uh, streams that, uh, for example, he has also worked with me on, uh, such as uh, entrepreneurship and some um, marketing aspects thereof in emerging economies. Uh, that is a little bit of an introduction of my uh, dear colleague, Leo Paz. And without further ado, I give the floor to uh, Professor Leo Paz. And um, we can start and run uh, the presentation of today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Emil. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And also, Erica and Emil, thank you for inviting me and organizing uh, this webinar. I look forward uh, to it very much. We had a little bit of a strange starting point. There was a fire drill uh, at my work. So uh, that happened about 10 minutes ago. So I'm sure we won't be disturbed during the webinar. It was well timed to happen before the webinar instead of during. I'll just start with sharing my screen so we can go straight into the content. Uh, I had a short slide introducing myself, but I think um, Emil did a, a great job. I don't want to add anything to that. So we'll go straight to today's agenda. And what I want to do is uh, start with the essence of machine learning and explain why we use machine learning. Then I'll go into some applications of machine learning, concentrating on marketing, because that's my field and that's where I can uh, say the most about. Uh, then we go into some problems and solutions around the implementation of machine learning. And I'll give a a uh, more philosophical look ahead into the future about where machine learning, AI, and related techniques are going to take us. But I think anything should start with why do you use something? What is it good for? Why do we need it? So if we scroll down one page, uh, there's two pictures here. Um, and I'd like to ask the participants, what do these two pictures make you think of? Where what is this referring to? Any idea? Okay, so basically what this is referring to is an experiment that was conducted to see whether financial um, experts were better at predicting the developments on the stock market or whether a random generator which simulates monkeys throwing darts at stocks to tell which ones to invest in and which ones to sell, who did best. It turned out that the random simulator, the monkeys throwing the darts, did better than the financial experts at predicting how the stock market developed. And there's a, a lot of literature on that topic. Uh, one very interesting book was written by Daniel uh, Kahneman, thinking fast and slow. And basically, he also mentions this example, but he goes into a more general issue uh, about human decision making and human prediction, and that is heuristic biases. If you look at financial experts, they often think that a stock that went up 
will have to go down soon. So they sell their winners. And a stock that went down has to go up again. So they hang on to their losers. This is called the disposition effect and it's well studied. More generally, we people tend to be biased when we're making decisions and when we're predicting stuff. And that means that the decisions that we make are suboptimal. And that's where data comes in and where models come in. Uh, if you take a look at this particular article on the internet, it's about a deep learning model predicting stock prices. And I looked at general stock developments with Italian co-author uh, Luca De Angelis. We published that in Journal of Applied Statistics. And we saw that a Markov model did quite well at predicting how the stock in general um, develops. So the reason that we use machine learning is to use data to make predictions and to support decisions because data-driven decision-making tends to lead to better results than decisions that are based on gut feelings. Okay, um, when we think about data-driven decision-making, there's a um, quite a different approach than we use in traditional uh, type of research. If you look at academic research and business intelligence, what often happens is that you begin with a theory, you formulate some hypothesis, you collect the data to test your hypothesis, and in the analysis, you find whether the hypothesis are supported or whether you do not find support for hypothesis. Now, in this era of big data, we have huge sets of data coming from many sources. We, we have terabytes of data, uh, browsing data, uh, surveys, uh, transaction data from uh, firms, scanner data from people's shopping behavior. Uh, this session is being recorded, so it's a form of uh, non-structured data. There's um, language coming through, there's visuals coming through my slides, my face-to-faces -face of the others. Uh, on the panel. Um, those are data that can be analyzed using complex algorithms. The whole idea is then flipping around the research paradigm. Instead of starting with theory and hypothesis, you start with data and analysis. And once you find patterns in the data, you theorize or hypothesize about why these patterns are occurring. So machine learning, summarizing, we use it to make better decisions. And what it is, is basically a form of statistical analysis where you explore the data for patterns. And then from those patterns, you derive theories, hypotheses, uh, and you support your decision-making. And if we take a look at the machine learning algorithms that there are, there's um, basically three main categories of algorithms unsupervised machine learning, supervised, and there's also reinforcement machine learning, which I will go into uh, at a much later stage of this presentation. Um, one of the things that I, I always find a little bit unfortunate about this whole area of big data and analytics and machine learning is the use of very complex terminology. If we think about what unsupervised machine learning is and supervised machine learning, it's, it's actually quite simple what's done. And I'll just use a few techniques to illustrate this. An unsupervised machine learning that I will explain is called k-means cluster analysis. A supervised machine learning technique that I'll go into is linear regression. Another one will be logistic regression. Let's start with these two, clustering and linear regression. These are techniques that are commonly used and, and many of you will have heard about those techniques. Now, what I've done here is that I've developed a hypothetical data set. It's not a big data set, it's a very small data set and it's visualized in a two dimensional space. What we have is two variables, income on the Y axis and age on the X axis. And each dot here, represents a person. So here, this particular dot where my arrow is pointing is a young person with a low income. Here, this dot here is an old person with a high income. And this dot here is, is the lucky person who has a young age and a high income. Um, now, what you do with unsupervised machine learning or cluster analysis 
is that you try to group entities, in this case, people, based on similarities and differences. Those people that are highly similar will be placed in the same group. People that are highly dissimilar will be placed in different groups. So in this case, we have three clusters. We have all the people with a high income, that's this cluster here. We have younger people with a high income and we have younger people with a low income. There are no dots in this space where people are old and have a low income. So it's clearly a hypothetical example, otherwise you would find dots here. So these are three groups that we have formulated. Now for marketing, grouping people customers or consumers in this manner is of key interest because you use these groups to formulate strategies. If you are formulating a strategy to target people with a high income and a high age, that strategy will be very different than for people who are young and have a low income. If we think about the car market, for example, uh, cars like Mercedes and BMW are more likely to be targeted here or here while um, cheaper cars will be targeted in this area. And here you might have smaller cars because you have older people, they don't have family. And here you might have larger cars because the people are younger and may still have a family. So unsupervised machine learning is basically nothing more than a big term for categorization. You can categorize people for market segmentation uh, if you look at Amazon, they'll categorize the books that people buy or music. Yeah? The music could be the composers Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart here. That will be classical. We might have Metallica, Iron Maiden, and ACDC here. That, that's hard rock. And maybe we have jazz here, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Billie Holiday, Ornette Coleman. And people who are buying Bach are more likely to also buy Mozart and Beethoven, and are probably less interested in Iron Maiden, ACDC, or Metallica, which is found in this cluster. So grouping products such as music can be uh, used for cross-sell generation. So all these groupings can be helpful to support your marketing decision-making. Which strategy should we have for certain people when we're segmenting people? Which books can be, or music styles can be cross-sold to each other? Unsupervised machine learning is about the categorization of entities. Supervised machine learning is a bit different. In this case, not all variables are the same. Not all variables are equal. In supervised machine learning, we have a dependent variable, income in this case, and an independent variable, age. And we try to predict income using age. A regression line is drawn through the dots, and these are the same people. And we find that as people become older, their income becomes higher. And on average, a 55-year-old will have a 90K yearly income in this particular model. And a younger person will, on average, have a lower income. These techniques are old. Uh, cluster analysis was developed in 1932 by Driver and Kruber. Uh, this is Kruber. And Pearson and Galton. Uh, developed uh, linear regression analysis. What is new these days is that we can apply these techniques to huge data sets. Instead of having just 10 people in our data set and two variables, we can have hundreds of variables and millions of, of people that, that we analyze or millions of entities if we're looking at um, musical products, for example, or books. So the Supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques are rather old. Unsupervised machine learning is about categorization. Supervised machine learning is about prediction. What's new these days is that we can use it on large data sets and the models can be generated automatically. And that gives us um, a next step. Is everything linear? So there are also more complicated models in which we're predicting nonlinear relationships, like logistic regression is meant for um, predicting yes, no variables. And then you get a S-curved relationships. If you have neural networks or fuzzy logic or 
uh, random forest techniques, those are other supervised machine learning techniques. The relationships between variables can be even uh, more complicated. So one of the things that is also new since the days of uh, Driver, Kruber, Pearson and Galton is that we can, with our current computing uh, power, estimate really complicated relationships. This logistic relationship in logistic regression was developed in the same year as D-Day took place, 1944, but there are much more modern algorithms that have been developed recently. Um, and um, that gives us a large amount of possible contributions. With the traditional machine learning algorithms, we can analyze structured data sets. Now, a structured data set is when you have, let's say, an Excel spreadsheet with very neat columns and rows. And maybe um, Emil is found on the first row. Uh, I'm found on the second row. I'm the second customer. Um, Erica is found on the third row. And then for each of the persons in that data set, we have the age in the first column, the income in the second column, the number of years that they have been in a, with our company in the third column, the number of sales that they make. And we have nice numerical information in those rows and columns. Now for that, you can use many of the supervised and in unsupervised machine learning techniques. But I think where the big revolution lies in machine learning and um, the um, application of new possibilities is so-called unstructured data. Unstructured data is not captured in neat rows and columns such as an Excel spreadsheet. It is verbal information like this particular angry customer having a chat with the company with which she is. It can be um, information that you find on reviews. Companies web scrape that in many cases to see what consumers are saying about their company. Um, AI makes it possible to analyze these complicated, unstructured types of data, which give companies additional information to uh, the data that is stored in structured formats. Structured forms of data can be survey information, transactional data, things like the products that you have, uh, the amount of money that you spend on products, the number of times that you visit a store of the company that you're with. But this unstructured data can be a complaint that you made via the phone, um, the web information or the points that you share on, on social media about the company. So there's a lot more possible than in the past. There's um, all types of data that we can use. And it's not just language that we can process, verbal or written language, face recognition is another possibility. We can see whether someone is happy or sad or even recognize someone's face to know which customer we're dealing with if privacy laws allow, obviously. Video analytics, we're um, recording the sessions so uh, we could analyze what is happening here with regard to the emotions that Maybe I am expressing or someone else is expressing. There's pattern recognition, there's um, forensic research, there's all sorts of uh, data that can be analyzed these days. Uh, a recent paper in Journal of Business Research discusses these possibilities. If we take a look at the applications, what can we do with unsupervised machine learning, which is categorization, and supervised machine learning, which is predicting stuff. Um, there's a very interesting book which was published 2015, uh, and it still uh, holds a lot of truth uh, about the working with big data, about machine learning, about analytics, by uh, a well-known authority, Thomas Davenport. And that book also goes into quite a few applications of machine learning and big data. Now, what Davenport starts with is that big data is applicable in any section that moves things or sells things to consumers, uses machines that can be monitored, sells or uses creative content, provides services, has physical facilities, is on the web, et cetera, et cetera. So data 
and analytics can be used anywhere to support decision making. So anywhere it makes sense to use data to group entities such as customers or products and to predict what someone is going to do or what's going to happen in the future. So when is a machine going to break down? That, that is a, a more of a logistic type of application of data. Um, there are obstacles. Um, often there's a saying that is said, data analytics is 80% data and 20% analytics. The idea behind it is that it is very difficult to build up a strong database and then once you have that database, the analytics is relatively easy to apply. I, I agree with that point, but I don't think it captures the full complexity of data and analytics. Um, before you start with the analytics, you need to think about the strategic problem that you're going to solve. If you are a provider of uh, mobile phone um, subscriptions, a big problem is that people may switch to from your mobile phone provider to a competitor due to a lower price. Um, another uh, um, strategic goal could be if you are a bank, um, you may have a small proportion of customers that have many products on which you are making a lot of profit, let's say 10%, and then 70% of your customers only have one or two products with you. They probably have many products at the competitor, and you're not making much profit over those 70% of your customers. How are you going to cross uh, sell and deep sell to those people? What products can you best offer to them? What will they be acquiring next? So starting with the strategy is one of the most important things that may go, uh, what, that, that needs to be considered when using big data analytics or machine learning. And what often goes wrong is that data are not integrated in business process. They're not linked to these strategic decisions. Instead, you may have someone with a high level of mathematical or statistical knowledge running a model, but not connecting back to the business problem at hand. So what's really important is that there are people who understand business and also understand analytics and vice versa. We need people who understand analytics who can also speak with business and not to business, they speak with business instead of preaching to them. And there's a lot of programs being developed at universities in which people are taught data science and business analytics to be able to combine business and analytics and data uh, in such a way that analytics and data are helped to resolve decision-making challenges. The other challenge can be that data-based decision-making is not well integrated in the business cultures. I have done quite a few workshops and with some of these workshops, you get people, for example, from the construction sector, which is quite conservative. If they try to use data, the managers usually do not like to base their decisions on data. Their idea is I've always done decision making based on my gut feelings and I've never been wrong. And uh, we've always done it like that. Why should we change? That's an argument that's often heard. So that's another challenge that we have. Uh, integrating the decision making in the business's culture so that uh, data can support decision making and is integrated in the process of the company. And if we look at some uh, examples, uh, web scraping, looking at what people say about your company, I've, I've mentioned that. Uh, marketing analytics can be selecting, if I'm a manager at a bank and we have a new credit card, maybe not everyone is interested in the credit card. Uh, if we look at the panel, maybe it's just me who's interested in a new credit card and not Emil or Erica. So I should be approached with the offer, but not the other two. Analytics can look at our characteristics, such as age, our spending behavior, whether we uh, sometimes are in the red on our transaction account, and then it can predict whether we will be interested in that credit card or not. Marketing analytics can be used to predict who leaves my company. That's the mobile phone example that I used earlier. I'm a, a marketing manager at Vodafone and I want to predict which customers are likely to leave so I can make them an offer to stay. Customer lifetime value. 
if someone joins my company, how much are they going to be worth for me? Let's say uh, Emil and I both join uh, the Bank of New Zealand, less likely for Emil to happen than for me, but let's say it happens. And they predict that Emil will be a more valuable customer on the long term than I am. In that case, they need to invest more in Emil than they are investing in me. Um, other applications, sales. So predict which addresses should be visited by a salesperson to see whether um, this person is going to make a sale. Um, tracking which way a, a traveling salesman should go to reduce travel time. Analytics can be used for that. Um, supply chain, optimizing travel routes, predicting which customers send goods back, not happy send back guarantee. If that's the case, and you find that certain customers are more likely to send a good back, you may not want to approach those customers with the offer because they're only going to cause you hassle and cost you money. Manufacturing, monitoring robots and other production devices. When are these performing well? When do they break down? Uh, when do certain parts need to be replaced? Human resources is another place where we use data and analytics. If we have information about our employees, then um, it may be of interest to see which employees are likely to leave. And if you don't want them to leave, you may want to give them some special uh, new conditions that they will stay with you. Um, where to place our office locations to reduce staff travel time. Analytics can resolve questions like that. Um, many other applications. Here's a very important one at the moment, credit scoring, fraud detection and risk modeling. This is important for taxation departments within governmental organizations and for banks. Uh, who is not paying that tax? Who is most likely to have uh, provided a false tax declaration? That's a big problem in many countries. And it can be predicted quite accurately which people's tax declaration you should investigate further. You can use the information about the persons and a machine learning technique to predict this. Credit scoring, if I apply for a loan at a bank, what is the chance that I default? If that chance is too high, according to my supervised machine learning algorithm, I should not be receiving the loan. Those are many of the applications that can be uh, used for business analytics. Um, it, there is sometimes trouble in paradise, however. There are problems, but where there's problems, there's usually um, solutions. Now, here are some examples of problems. Um, low quality data. Uh, this is a big issue. Getting your data right before you apply a machine learning technique or any forms of analytics is a key point. Otherwise, uh, you will be developing very poor models. Models can at times be unethical. If you use certain variables that result in discrimination, that's something you definitely need to prevent uh, from happening with your models. Um, there could be what's called a black box model. You can't look inside the model what's happening. If you look at modern AI techniques or neural networks, um, you may not be able to assess what the model is exactly doing. And that is um, a risk because if something is wrong in the model and you can't uh, comprehend the model as a person, you might be implementing a incorrect uh, model. And I've, I've seen examples um, of that occurring uh, in practice. And I'll just share a very simple one that was reported in the media some time ago uh, or uh, in the um, literature for machine learning. Um, that was a genetic algorithm, which is a complicated algorithm. It tried to estimate at what speed aeroplanes use the smallest amount of fuel. The algorithm was not given any parameters, and it turned out that flying backwards would lead to the generation of fuel. So that was a very easy one to resolve. But the main point there is that the algorithm doesn't understand the domain. So it's always important that you understand what's happening in the model, what's driving predictions in the model to prevent issues from occurring. Another issue that often occurs is causality. 
Causality means that sometimes cause and effect are uh, either uh, confused or it's not there. So a, a big conversation that was held since the 1950s was uh, the relationship between smoking and, and lung cancer. And the cigarette producers denied that smoking resulted in lung cancer. They said there was another common cause, the drinking behavior of people. That is causing this relationship. But what happened was that researchers corrected for drinking behavior, they corrected for other unhealthy behavior, and there was still, as we now know, a very strong effect of smoking on lung cancer. So here we figured out which other variables could play a role in lung cancer, and we found that there is indeed a very strong effect of smoking on lung cancer, and uh, that is a generally uh, accepted point now. But my point with this example is that it took about 20 or 30 years in this very simple case to get uh, agreement on this causality. I have to say there was some personal interest there by the cigarette manufacturers, but nevertheless, it took a long time of research to get this causality right. So if you're machine learning and quickly finding causes and effects, you could run into problems. And here's an example of where it went wrong, which I often accounted in practice. So in New Zealand, I have a card for my supermarket countdown and New Zealand, that's my travel point card and flybys, which is uh, across different shops, you can use it. The idea of these loyalty cards is that people who, clients who have the loyalty cards will be better clients for you than people who don't have the loyalty card. And I've seen an experiment happen here, and we found that um, there is um, a um, distinction. People who had bought the loyalty card have a higher profit increase than people who didn't have the loyalty card. And the problem here is, is that we have a biased sample. People voluntarily bought the loyalty card. We didn't force anyone to um, buy a lo loyalty card. So the issue here is that um, these samples are not directly comparable. So what we find is that the strong, the good clients got the loyalty card and the bad clients didn't buy the loyalty card. So the causality could be that people who are good clients of yours get the loyalty card, but without the loyalty card, you also would have made a lot of profit off them. While the bad clients uh, don't get the loyalty card, without the loyalty card, or even with the loyalty card, they would still not be making much profit. Some of my colleagues in the Netherlands uh, published a paper on this. And they found that if there is this difference where the loyalty card uh, leads to a 4% profit increase instead of a 2% profit increase, uh, only 7% of this increase, 7% out of 2%, so that's 0.14%, is likely to be due to the loyalty card. They corrected for all sorts of other effects. So machine learning, it is a, um, there, there is the distinction between grouping, which is unsupervised machine learning, predicting is supervised machine learning. Uh, you need good data for it. It needs to be integrated in your company processes. If you have students with that type of knowledge, they're very likely to find themselves a, a high level job uh, in the current market where we're basing ourselves more and more on data but you still need to think very carefully what comes out of your model. Do I really have causality here? Uh, is it ethically acceptable what I'm doing or are there other issues? And that leads us to, to looking into the future. Some time ago, my PhD supervisor and a colleague wrote a book about uh, the virtual guardian angel. They described a, uh, mobile platform that you could carry around with you. You could use it as a phone. You could use it for banking. You could use it to pay for products. You could use it to buy stuff. And this has been implemented in the form of a mobile phone. And 
They also suspected that they, this was going to go further and further in terms of medical advice, uh, when to buy a mortgage, when to walk into a restaurant. Uh, it's going to develop further and further. And every step of the way, the uh, mobile phone is going to help us with decision making. And it's going to help us make better decisions. This is the positive look of things. There's another book by um, Yuval Noah Harari. Um, his previous book was on Homo sapiens, where he looked at the history of everyone in the last 70,000 years. It's, it's an author who likes big topics. And this current or this more recent book of this is called Homo Deus. It's called The Human God. And the picture that uh, Yuval uh, gives us is that we may be at the stage of developing algorithms that will completely rule us. So we will be at the surface as humanity at the surface of algorithms. So this is a very dark picture. It's also a book that if you're feeling a little bit depressed and you need something to cheer you up, this is not the book to go to, um, but it does give a very stark warning. This is the very positive aspect where the computer will support us in decision-making and algorithms will support us. So in the future, we would like to see algorithms supporting us and not we being just a slave to algorithms. And that brings me to, to my final slide. I think the whole area of data and analytics is a highly multidisciplinary area. You have the engineers who develop algorithms, who develop the capabilities to do the computing for these algorithms so that we can predict who wants which product, who will leave our company, who is going to default on the loan, et cetera, et cetera. But these people are really good at the technical aspect, the societal aspects. We need people from business. We need people who understand law. We need data ninjas who can analyze the data. So in summary, I think algorithms require a combination between the computer and between humanity, the cold algorithm to come up with the right decisions and the human to ensure that we are also doing the right thing by humanity, by our customers and by anyone that we're analyzing. And well, most of all, I think it's a, it's a very interesting area to be in. I saw uh, a number of questions on uh, where we can go to uh, with regard to analytics. There's, there's a huge uh, yeah, number of possibilities for people. Data governance is, is an area, building algorithms, implementing it in companies, et cetera. I'll just stop sharing at this point. And I see there's a few questions in the chat. Emil, would you like me to go into those questions or? Um, yeah, I think this is about the time to to dive a bit uh, deeper into the questions. So first of all, uh, Leo, thanks for this excellent contribution and uh, giving us some new insights and refreshing insights on big data and machine learning for business analytics. Um, as you can see yourself, there are a few questions raised by participants in the group here. Um, yeah, maybe it's it's uh, it's good to to go briefly through them, starting with the first one. I think you can see them too. So yes, the first okay. one, hi, Professor Leo. What are the differences between ML, AI, and deep learning? Yep. Yeah. So um, it, it's it's a, a, a definite definitional term. If you look at um, deep learning, that's a form of neural networks. And neural networks, um, if they become really complicated, it's deep learning. Um, artificial intelligence is, is a term that is used quite broadly these days. It used to be um, predominantly used for machines that can come up uh, with rules uh, independently to supervise decision-making. Um, but these days it's used quite commonly, even linear regression analysis is, is sometimes called AI. And I, I think it's linear regression is still linear regression analysis. It has been for 120 years. The, the terms are used quite interchangeably. Machine learning is probably the more broad term that um, looks at exploratory statistics that are classical and um, also these newer techniques. I think in general, uh, the way I look at it is that you have algorithms 
that can automatically detect patterns in the data. And some of those algorithms are quite simple. Uh, they usually call machine learning and they can be applied to structured data sets like an Excel spreadsheet or an SPSS data set. And then things like AI and deep learning can also be applied to more complicated unstructured data sets like, like language spoken or written or um, emotions in, in data sets, video processing, um, et cetera. And well, that actually leads us to the second question. What is the most exciting thing on the horizon in AI and machine learning? Um, I personally think the detection of human emotion, just the machine becoming quite aware about what we are thinking, what we are feeling, and being able to analyze that. Uh, I've heard one of my PhD students is now looking at uh, Twitter communications and seeing what emotions are expressed in that text. And we're trying to predict donation behavior from the emotions that people are expressing in Twitter about certain companies. And we're finding that certain emotions expressed in Twitter are linked to donation behavior. Uh, there have been other experiments where uh, people have been communicating with a um, person and an AI algorithm and were asked which one was the AI algorithm and which one was the person. They thought the AI algorithm was the person because that AI algorithm was showing more compassion. So um, that is um, quite an interesting one to look at. I think also uh, the composing of music by AI algorithms is quite interesting. So just the whole human thinking aspect. Another exciting one, but in a less positive way, is um, the use of AI by students uh, to, to make their assignments and, and their, um, uh, their, their stuff for learning. And um, that is um, a threat of, of, of AI. Okay, as a recent business graduate, how important is data science knowledge when entering the job market? Well, it depends a little bit um, on the role that you want to do. I mean, if you are, are going into uh, research, market research, or doing anything related to computers or data collection, then probably you need to know a lot about data science. But even if you go into management, you need to at least know how data science and data can be used um, to resolve business problems. What can you ask from a data science? What do you need to question? What, what makes sense or doesn't make sense? I'll, I'll give you an example here in New Zealand. I won't mention any names of companies, but a big company here, uh, I heard by a consultant working for that company was advised that they needed survey data to segment their customers. They had a large customer database. So instead of using survey data, you use your own transactional data uh, first. And the manager was not aware of that. And um, the consultant thankfully advised the manager on this, but without the consultant, a wrong decision would have been made on the use of data. So you need that to double check what others are telling you to know what you're asking and know how you use um, data. Okay, um, I'll just continue, Emil, with the next, yep. Yeah, totally fine. Zealand firms are reaching out to use big data tools in the way they should be. What are your thoughts on the marketing landscape in New Zealand? Um, that's a very good question. Um, if I compare with Europe and the Netherlands that I know is that um, yeah, New Zealand is lagging behind to some degree. The Netherlands, if I look at ING and some of the other banks, some of them are already using algorithms to make automated models. In New Zealand, it depends on the firm. So many of our firms are SMEs. They are not doing much on this area, maybe just some cross tabulations, so that's, that's very simple tools for business intelligence, Power BI, stuff like that, some visualization perhaps. If I look at the banks uh, and New Zealand, uh, some of the governmental um, institutions like IRD, 
they are doing um, quite a bit more, uh, mobile phone companies, so there the progress is quite rapid. What I am seeing is that there's a um, huge growing demand for graduates who can analyze data. Um, com companies are approaching me to be able to get in touch with our students, which I gladly help them with, obviously, but also are telling me that they find it very difficult to find people who can analyze data in a way that can support their decision making. And um, yeah, so I think there's, there's a very high pace of catching up going on, but we, we tend to be a little bit later in New Zealand. It's a small economy far away from everything, but it, it is growing rapidly. I'm assuming that Singapore is quite a bit ahead of us. Well, I don't know Singapore that well, but I definitely know the Netherlands is. Yeah, this is a really good question. What are some of the significant dangers or risks associated with big data and machine learning? And how can these issues be managed and mitigated? Yeah, I mentioned a few, I think, in my presentation. One is ethics. It's really important that you don't do stuff that is disadvantaging people, that is uh, using variables that are linked to someone's gender or ethnicity or other sensitive types of variables that, that should not be in models. Uh, that it's just unfair and, and unethical. Um, the other point is um, if you use very complicated models like AI, you may have mistakes in the model. So what is always important is that let's say you score people on the probability to purchase a credit card from your bank. What you need to do is this probability that the AI algorithm produces should be modeled with a more simple model like linear regression or a tree-based model. And then if you see um, that, let's say someone's shoe size is predicting whether they buy a credit card, this is just a very obvious example, or there is a negative effect of the number of purchases someone made, then you know something is not right with the model. You have to double check what went wrong. So. I think the best way of mitigating it always goes back to my final, my last slide that I showed, that is um, ensuring that you as a business person or an analyst, preferably an analyst in collaboration with a business expert, analyzes whether the model makes sense. And if the model doesn't make sense, probably something has gone dramatically wrong and whether it's ethical. What geographic areas, regions do you think can benefit most from big data and machine learning? If these regions are developing, what can business governments do better to support moves uh, in this area? Um, geographical areas, I think economically developed economies are, are probably where the most benefit can be um get it through this for a number of reasons first of all um big data and analytics uh requires a financial investment which is, is easier for larger companies in wealthy countries the other one is if you look at the more economically developed world we are doing more and more stuff online so instead of seeing your customers you're just seeing what they're doing online so you need models to be in conversation with them. When we used to go to the bank, I don't go to the bank office anymore. Um, the, car, the teller would be able to cross sell products, tell us, ask us what we're interested in, um, have a conversation of stuff that's going right or wrong. Um, now it's all online. So models need to be able to uh, do that. Um, and then, yeah, if these regions are developing, what can businesses, governments do to better support moves in this area? Um, I work at a university, so my answer may sound a little bit biased, but I'm, I'm going to give that answer anyway. I think closer collaboration between businesses, governments, and universities is, is crucial. First of all, we need 
businesses and government, uh, uh, public sector uh, institutions are finding it hard to find the right graduates. So getting involved in that, having work placements with universities, making everything more practical um, is, is, is quite an important movement. The other one is that book of Davenport that I mentioned in my uh, presentation that is developing business analytics or analytics in general, machine learning and the use of data very step by step. If you are a small company just starting to do some simple analytics and you want to make the jump to AI in one go, it's going to be a disappointment most likely, unless you're uh, some type of uh, technical internet startup. But in most cases, that's not going to work. Just this gradual improvement is, is another important one. So I think the knowledge is really important, which is gathered by collaborating with universities. And the second one is having the ambitions that are in line with what's possible. Um, I see two more questions. I'll, I'll address these. Uh, I guess if we have tons of data, it could help build an accurate model for prediction. At the same time, to begin with machine learning, we might not have enough data to feed. How do we decide when it is a good time to begin with machine learning? So two answers to that question, Rohan. Uh, the first one is, yeah, I think starting with simple analytics is, is often good unless you have a lot of technical knowledge in house. So making cross tables, using things like Power BI, using business uh, uh, intelligence type of decision making. And the second one is we might not have enough data to feed the algorithm. Well, one of my students, part-time student, he was a consultant and the company had seven or eight questions. And he said, I need data of multiple time points across a period of three or four years. And then I said, well, let's just write up the questions that your client has. So we wrote up the eight questions. It turned out that the first four or five questions or four or five of the questions could be answered using data of one time point, cross-sectional data. The other three questions needed longitudinal data from multiple time points. So I told them, yeah, start with what you can answer, answer those questions, and then ask for um, more data, the longitudinal data. So I would say, try to adjust to the level of knowledge that is present in the company. And in addition, um, pick the low hanging fruits first. So solve the problems that you can solve with the data that you have. And once you have this best practice case, that's when you get a support from management because that's often one of the crucial factors that is missing. And then you can proceed with the more complicated stuff. Okay, and then the last point, you mentioned that data machine learning is not connected to decision-making within the system or program. How can this decision-making be part of the machine learning from regularized uh, human um, response? Um, so that is, something I'm always really apprehensive about. Um, that there are algorithms like reinforcement machine learning that uh, take decisions and learn independently. Um, if you remember um, the Go master, Lee Sedol, Sedol Lee, he was beaten by a reinforcement machine learning algorithm in 2016. And that algorithm basically came up with rules to play Go correctly. If you're doing marketing, you could make offers to people and then see if they reject an offer, what other offer should be next. And then the algorithm gets updated automatically all the time and uh, learns from the interactions that it has with a person. So in that case, the decision-making, the human decision-making is automated into the algorithm. Um, it's possible, it's, it's been applied in the Netherlands. In New Zealand, I know of one company who's experimenting with reinforcement machine learning. AI can do this also in a different way. 
Um, I would always say, and, and most companies do that, that there should be some human surveying of that algorithm to prevent unethical stuff from happening, to prevent uh, mistakes from happening, uh, and just to combine the knowledge of this human and, and this algorithm. And uh, yep, I think that's, that's a really nice closing question and, and oh, be mindful of the time, but your time permitting, Leo, because I know that you also have to move on uh, with other appointments later on. Maybe a brief response to, to the last two questions, and then uh, it's about time for us to wrap up. Yeah, the, the last question, that's reinforced machine learning. That's the automation part. I think I just discussed that point. Well, data and machine learning are separate to the human body. Um, I think it's already being integrated in the human body. If you look at hearing aids that are being developed, people who are paralyzed so that there is this, this suit around them that they can move and it's integrated with the brain. Um, yeah, this is starting and it is going to be integrated with the human body more and more. And um, it, you fall, uh, the book I mentioned, Homo Deus, um, speaks of cyborgs. So the, techn technically, there are already many possibilities. We do have to be very careful in what direction that goes in terms of ethics. And um, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, the ethics are probably going to lag with regard to the developments that uh, are technically possible. And, uh, and the law is even going to lag further on that. So we really need to see what is going to happen there, whether this is going to be used for good or, or, or for bad. But this is starting already. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, that is going to proceed onwards. All right, we, we, we leave it here, I think, uh, Leo, for, uh, for today. Um, well, what can I say? Uh, first of all, I'm very grateful uh, for, for you having us here in this uh, SIDBA webinar, Professor uh, Leo. Thanks for this excellent contribution and um, teaching us a little bit more, uh, giving some more insights on big data and machine learning for business analytics. As you may have seen from quite a number of questions that were raised is that it's, it's certainly a hot topic and people are very keen to learn more and, and see how the future uh, will kind of unfold. Uh, in front of our eyes and uh, it's just perfect to learn a bit a little bit more from you about this topic what's uh, what's going on from both practical as well as a theoretical perspective so uh, thanks a lot for this I think um, it's time to 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 close it's exactly one hour uh, and um, yeah I think we uh, we're going to wrap up here and uh, again thank you so much I also like to thank all the participants here in the room my colleagues I see students uh, I see also people that I even don't know. So probably they have checked in from uh, outside our organization. So that's maybe even better. So thanks all of you for, for joining today and, and being part of this uh, sit by webinar series. And uh, well, hopefully see you all uh, next time in another uh, session of, um, of this uh, webinar series. So thank you and uh, have a good day ahead. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your day. Thanks Emil. And Erica, thank you both for having me over. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.